Yama, Bo Spiram, Gumaroi Kuma, Marawari. Um, I was born in Western Sydney and grew up uh, on the south side of Brisbane, just um, you know, just down the road here in Acacia Ridge. Um, and yeah, I guess my introduction to this is through my podcast, Frontier War Stories, um, um, that looks at you know uh, the similar history that Annie Judy has been you know, uh, you could say archiving for many, many years through her, her amazing uh, way of curating these stories as well. Um, and yeah, you know, I'd like to, you know, f for the both of you to introduce yourselves and I guess we'll go with you first start, you know, um, before we go, yeah, tell us, you know, your name and your mob. So my name's Judy Watson. Uh my family are one year people. I'd like to also acknowledge my mother here, Joyce Watson, and my brother, Donald Watson. My grandmother, Grace Isaacson, was camp. Mabel Daly, great-grandmother, Rosie, great-great-grandmother. However, I was born in Mandabra and grew up in Acacia Ridge, another Acacia Ridge in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Definitely, definitely. Can't get enough of us. <laughs> oh, Gilmore Falls, yeah, shout out to Gilmore Falls, yeah, nah, and Amanda says yourself? Yeah, um, my name's Amanda Heyman, um, I also grew up on the south side, um, I grew up in Logan, um, all across there, but I've got cultural connections to Kalkadoon and Waka Waka country. Mm. Deadly, um, I guess just before, you know, laying the platform and bringing art in, Sis, could you tell us a bit about the work that you do about creating space uh, and why, you know, there's, you know, yourself and I guess your work colleagues wanted to, you know, create a you know, backlash? Um, I've got a background in visual arts, so I, I went to uni thinking that I'd be a famous artist. No. Um, but uh, I, I uh, did a lot of freelance work um, at the start of my career, but then I went into um, state government role. And so I did a lot of um, community engagement, but still like very creative work, um, curating exhibitions and bringing community together um, and listening to stories. And, and that's, um, yeah, I was uh, working inside government for about 11 years and then decided it was time to leave and start my own business. Um, so Black Clash Creative, um, we did a lot of um, exhibitions and events in the beginning. So um, Katina Davidson's in the room. Um, Katina um, and Freya Carmichael. Um, we started Black Clash Collective in the early days. So um, three Aboriginal women curators um, and we worked on like a number of really cool projects together and kind of like Black Lash evolved from there. So they've now got um, their expertise. Um, Katina works at Quagoma and Freya is an excellent um, uh, curator that focuses on, um, you know, textiles and um, weaving. Uh, so we've gone on um, but we still kind of collaborate every now and again. Uh, but Black Lash has since kind of COVID pivoted into um, more shared space, so public spaces. We're now looking at um, interior design. We've got Erin McDonald here um, on our team. Um, and we're doing like big public artworks and also working Indigenous narratives into public spaces, so working alongside community and translating stories in, um, for architects to embed in the built environment. Um, yeah, so really exciting new kind of work coming out of the next um, years, um, helping grow the city. And we're really, um, really grateful to be working with Annie Kerry a lot um, closely um, to, yeah, make sure that local stories are, are shared in an appropriate way. Yeah, I guess the reason why I ask that is because, you know, we're in a building that holds archives, yeah. you know, that were collected at a time 
where you know the most horrendous things that happened to us was done under, a, I guess you could say, their law, and mm -hmm. was justified by their science as well. Um, you know, and you know, uh, and I guess just 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 lastly as well, yeah. How important is it to sort of take up space or create space for mob to do that? Yeah, it's really important. Like, I guess when you're in. Um, a position um, external from these kind of um, places. I feel like we're listened to a little bit more than when you're internal. Um, that's just my experience, but there's still a lot of institutional racism that happens around the place. And so if you're getting an expert um, in to these spaces to work with the staff. I think you're taken more seriously. That's just my kind of experience, yeah. You agree, Art? I do, and I think as an artist, we're in a different position because we're like slippery fish and we can just, <laughs> you know, slide through, you know, under perceptions and just say, oh, we're just an artist, you know, sort of, and uh, we don't have to... You do have to answer to your community and mob but at the same time, you don't have to be, even though many of us are qualified academics, you don't have to sort of fit a certain mould. So I think that artists, and I mean artists in the bigger term, can actually really play, and that's what Richard Bell talks about too, being an activist artist. Um, and not everybody does that, but you can do things in your own way, and I think that artists can lift the lid and then expose things and then people can take with it what they want, but it's also just pulling things up to the light so that people can read them and see things in a different way and we can seduce them in, you know, we pull them mm -hmm. in and then suddenly they've swallowed the hook and that's it, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about this then. Um, the, the title, um, was it easy to come up with? That was Amanda. Yeah. Mm. Um, I guess just... I was like, I'll start from the beginning. I was um, approached to um, curate this exhibition. And I think after looking at a lot of Judy's work, um, yeah, there was a lot of references to bones and blood vessels and, you know, like the body, body of country. Um, and so skeletons was kind of like popping out, but also like, the, the meaning of skeletons as in um, skeletons in the closet mm -hmm. um, about opening um, up something to shed light on stories. Mm. Well, do you want to take us through some of the stuff that, you know, you have and, you know, I guess how you come about sort of creating them? Well, this one on the screen at the moment, it's actually something that Amanda and Troy, um, through Blacklash, <coughs> were the sort of initiators of again do you want to talk about that yeah, yeah i guess water the, under the bridge. Mm. just as you walk through the space um there's those two low-hanging um flags and it's meant to be like a kind of like a threshold that you walk through to experience um this space <laughs> um, so <Just> <laughs> like like curatorially like if you're thinking about skeletons in the closet it's kind of like walking through those doors into a space that's enclosed and I really loved that the butcher's aprons one and two um, they had some really strong language on them and so you know when you think about the the archives and the records you see the strong language that's used. So I kind of think it, it's kind of like warning signs that like what you're gonna be walking into is kind of heavy, um, but also it's a threshold to acceptance and like, um, you know, if you can get through these kind of strong words, let's talk about other stories. And the, these works were made in 1994 when I had a the first Asia Link residence in India. And at the time I was really thinking about our situation coming from Australia as Aboriginal people, but also India under, you know, a similar sort of vein or thread of colonisation and how they felt about it, how I felt about it. 
And my father, uh, Don Watson, who's no longer with us, at the time had sent me through some mail, very sn slow mail to India, but it had some, um, an article about the Save the Flag, Save the Australian Flag group, and in it they said, we want to keep our flag, as in the Australian flag, in the way that we received it, you know, this country. And so my, my report was, or reply was, rape, slaughter, dispossession. That's the way I felt like it was received. And at the time, um, I was in Jaipur, Rajasthan, and, you know, various other places, um, making work Bhopal, and got these pieces of muslin at a local market, um, asked people to send flags over, which I sewed on. I originally had the Union Jack as well, you know, sort of, which is called the butcher's apron and the Australian flag. And it's that idea of it's almost like a patch, but a, a discredited patch in a way, sort of on these, these documents. And as you say, great idea as being the sort of like, you know, the thresholds you have to pass through. Mm. Yeah, you know, I think it's something that like, with blackfellas, you know, we have to sort of be, um, well, we're constantly uncomfortable with sort of the situation that we have to sort of be comfortable, you know, so in a way where, you know, and, and I guess that's the thing as well, you know, it's about making people sort of feel that, you know, uncomfort to sort of try and find, you know, what it is that we're actually saying. And, you know, like, like one thing that I always sort of say in the podcast is like history, it always informs us about our relationships, yeah. you know, and um, how we've become to be in the current position that we are in, you know, 200 odd years later as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the, like you mentioned, the, um, the power structures still exist, mm -hmm. these things as well. And um, we, you know, we've got to use what we can to sort of have those conversations, mm -hmm. you know, um, which is amazing as well. Um, but yeah, tell us a bit about, um, I do want to get to the, to, to ask you, you know, why you sort of focus on this area, but before we get there, any other pieces in this that really stand out? Well, this is the new work. This is Shadow Bone, and this was looking at the records that uh, Jonathan Richards, archivist, um, had pulled out of the records for many purposes, but also for Rachel Perkins' new sort of, you know, sort of Australian Wars documents, is that correct, I think? Yep, yep. And so having a look at those records, there were so many to work from. And there's another video there called Body of Evidence, which has got all of those records, and you can see it in the vitrine. And, you know, it's just spooling through all those be beautiful handwritten documents. Michelle Helmrich over here has transcribed some of the the records, and then you hear Daniel Browning's voice, the beautiful sound of Daniel Browning's voice, you know, Bunjalung and many other nations, man, reading them out. Because sometimes sound, as you would know, just goes through you, and you can't stop it, and it's so powerful, and it just takes hold of you until you can't get rid of it. You can't get rid of it. And this one has got some of the dental records of my family, and when I said to my dentist, oh, yeah, I want to get these for a video. He said, do you want mine as well? And so I said, sure. <laughs> so his, his teeth are starring in there as well. But it's, you know, various artworks. It's, you know, that you will see repeated in here. And then there's also Oscar, this young, you know, Aboriginal boy who was taken away from um, his family, survived, you know, saw massacres, and then was given a notebook when he was about 17 or earlier, and did these amazing drawings. So his family were from Cooktown or whatever, but he's detailing in them, you know, what was going on with the native police and many other things. So it's sort of like those records. And now I think with all of those sorts of things, once they come in, suddenly the people up there, they all want to know more about Oscar's work. These things were in the National Museum of Australia. I'd heard about a little bit with the 19th century Aboriginal art exhibition that was put on years ago. But I think, once again, it's uncovering these amazing gems that is really important for all of us to know and understand what has happened here. And the fact is, this is all Aboriginal land, but it's a shared ground that we're on. And so for anyone who comes here, you should know what's going on. 
because it's something that you can't get away with, we can't get away with it, we have to live with it, mm. and it's a shared history. So mm. you need to know. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, you know, I remember on the podcast I was young with um, a musician and he spoke about how, it's just sort of on what you were saying, uh, you know, the, the whole thing of get over it. You know, we're constantly reminded, you know, uh, by, you know, the statues that are in, that are positioned, you know, the, the, the name of the roads to the parks that we play in as well. Um, you, know, you know, when you hear things like that, you know, to get over it, you know, um, well, you know what comes to mind? Well, that was another project was water under the bridge because, you know, we're always constantly being told, get over it, you know, get over it. This was something that happened years ago, nothing to do with my family now. You know, we didn't sort of, you know, do this to you. However, you know, it might not be you, but your ancestors or other people in the past in this country you live in did, and it's like nobody gets away with it. This is something, a challenge we have to do. So that, um, do you want to talk about the water under the bridge? Yeah, I think, um, so uh, we curate a exhibition for Brisbane City Council um, and that was um, a commissioned work for the Howard Smith Wharf site. So water under the bridge was a new commission um, by Judy um, to be projected up really big and large. And it was kind of like a timeline of black holes in history. Yes. So like things that we weren't ta taught in schools. Um, so not just Aboriginal kind of facts, but also South Sea Islander um, facts as well. Um, yeah, and a like really powerful, like big, bold statement um, up on the cliffs. And, and also, I mean, it's never just me, it's a whole group of t people, mm. team of people who works on these projects. But when I was at the University of Cambridge, uh, Jocelyn Dudding, if anyone wants to look at photo libraries and histories, she's a New Zealander who works there and she sends out photos to anybody who wants. She was showing me some of these images, which were South Sea Island people on a boat in Brisbane River, you know, being sent back out to the islands, um, you know, after Federation. Mm -hmm. And it was, so then I've, you know, sort of put her in touch with other people I know with that mm -hmm. shared background. But she'll, you know, please, if anybody wants to contact them while she's still there, please do that. So obviously Amelda Miller and others, you know, mm -hmm. that exchange of opportunities of histories and things like that is there. And I think that's what this, all of these projects do. It's uncovering those histories. Um, and I'm not an expertise in doing this forensic sort of archivist, you know, sort of, um, you know, research, but I work with people who are really great. Same with video, same <coughs> with sound, everybody else. And so we all do it as a group project. You did sort of mention, answer this question before in regards to sort of being like an activist sort of artist as well. But a lot of your work has sort of come from truth telling. Um, has it always? And, 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 and like, yeah. Um, how come you've, uh, uh, yeah, there's a, a big portion of your work that sort of looks at, you know, this period of time? Uh, I think it depends. It depends on what I'm doing at the time. I think probably the first, um, I studied first in the 1970s, you know, sort of left Brisbane, went up to Toowoomba, late 70s, to study at um, Darling Downs Institute. And while I was there, I was doing work um, which related to the literary studies I was doing as well as my elective. And I was re reading and, and uh, we were learning a lot about um, Native American, uh, African American, Jewish American literature. We were also doing studies on women's literature. And that's when I thought, I want to know more about my own heritage. I, you know, we would go up and visit my family in Mount Isa all the time, or we'd go out to stations that she worked on, uh, my grandmother and my grandfather, etc. And that's when I was starting to make work, um, you know, like Death of a Race and with massacres and bones and things like that. So that's probably one of the earlier works, Trail of Tears, thinking about, well, there's a Trail of Tears in the States, but there were plenty of trails of tears mm. here 
where people were wa walked Marched, yeah. to missions and reserved or also walked off country or walked to massacre sites. Um, so it's those, a recognition of shared Indigenous histories around the world and how there's something when you get people together with those sh that shared burden of colonisation, suddenly you find that there's all these stories that seem to match up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have you done work in the past with like other Indigenous peoples around the world and sort of, you know, shared those conversations, those histories? Yeah. Um, I suppose each time I travel, but one of the best ones was uh, early 95, was uh, an Indigenous artist camp in Rotorua, Upper Moana, Marae, New Zealand, Aotearoa, and there were Indigenous artists from around the world and sometimes we were making work together and a lot of the times you stay in contact with those people and I always think that it's almost like um, if you're getting sent to a, another country it's like sometimes if it's a government assisted thing which this one wasn't you know it's like an arrow is sent out and implants itself in that place and then from there you meet somebody and then that arrow comes back again and suddenly you get this crisscross of like a spider web where people are going back and forth. And mm. it's the same here in Australia as well. Mm. And we're making connections, we're sharing that information. And it's a really valuable way of like the old message sticks. Mm. And you know, that, those trade routes and things, we're sharing information and we're pulling people along with us. Mm. How is it, you know, working in museums or archives or these big institutions that hold remains, um, artifacts, all these different, like, Back in, I think it was 2013, 14, um, through the museum in town, we got uh, to repatriate some bones through Uncle Bob and a lot of the work that he's done for decades um, as well. And there was us, I think maybe another two or three other mobs, you know, uh, we drove back home to St. George or back to St. George and then the other mob sort of went their way and we done our thing. You know, it was, it was, a, it was, it was amazing to be a part of that process. Um, but what's it like sort of, yeah, you know, going behind the doors and sort of working in these places. Well, I, I say that artists are there to rattle the bones of the museum. So it's like that thing of shaking things up and just so that, and also just saying, you know, we're here introducing ourselves to everything within the museum because there's a lot there. There's ancestors, all of the beautiful hair string and, you know, sort of... Um, fibre string skirts from our country, for example, if it's hair, it's taken from people's heads, which the DNA is there from our family. It's rolled along the leg. Uh, it's worn, you know, on the body. So it's swishing back and forth and picking up DNA and sweat. So when those objects are taken, say to an overseas museum or somewhere else, the old people are still in there. And those objects are not dead, they're alive. So it's for everyone who works there um, to care for them, to know that those objects are alive. And a lot of my work has been looking at that. Once again, I'm not, I'm not the best, you know, researcher, but I work with people who are. Mm -hmm. uh, just, I'll just show you on this one here too. This is an older work, but it was Richard Bell and Michelle Helmrich, again, who in the work up the back uh, did a show about one square mile, you know, sort of the, the boundary street markers, the exclusion zone. And so those shields were from the University of Queensland Anthropology Museum um, that we were shown at the time. And it's from dusk to, till dawn, five Brisbane shields. So it's talking about that time, but also resistance. And these are the, you know, the numbering on the uh, shields themselves. Mm. For yourself, Amanda, I guess, walking into spaces like this, you know, so somebody who's, who creates space for mob, but then also coming to space where, like Aunt said, you know, I mean, like our old people are sort of, you know, still attached to these places. What's it like for yourself? Um, it's uh, conflicting, I guess. Um, but we're like really excited to work with the state archives at kind of looking at opportunities across this space to make it more welcoming. So that's an exciting project that we're um, working ongoing with um, the State Archives. Um, but I guess 
these institutional buildings were never kind of made to be welcoming for our mob. So they were designed not to be. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a challenge. But, like... Thanks for the change, now. <laughs> yeah, things are happening, eh? Yeah, about time. No, um, the, it's, it's challenging because we know there's so much information here about our, our families. Um, and, and information, what information are we talking about? It's like state records. So, so children being removed, mm. people being married, mob being removed from mission to mission, asking for permission, you know, mm. ma massacres and all these things. Yeah. So all that stuff is here. Yeah. So the um, certificates of exemption that you've printed out. Judy. I think everybody's got oh. a copy of that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for everyone at the State Archives so quickly getting that together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did, you, did you just want to talk a bit about sort of wanting to give some people uh, that, that art? So I think we said that our, all our families had this. Yeah. This relates in a way to the first time I saw some of these archives and it was Oh, I might have seen them before, but it was actually at a talk by um, Loris Williams, who was the first Aboriginal archivist, and Margaret Reed, and they were talking about Indigenous um, people and the right to vote. And mm -hmm. I'd just been asked to do a project about um, sufferance and, you know, women's right to vote mm -hmm. in Queensland. Well, I thought, well, of course I want to do it, mm -hmm. you know, Aboriginal um, women. And so there were some of these documents but there were other ones really related to who your bloodline was and I'd never heard the term a preponderance of Aboriginal blood but it means Aboriginality through both sides of the family. Mm -hmm. If you have that you do not have the right to vote, uh, you know, depending upon where you are mm -hmm. and there were many other things. And so then if you had one, one was white, one was black? It, right? it all depended, yes. Because yeah. I know, cause I know in, in, in Canada they have similar laws like yeah. I think where women just weren't allowed, no. Indigenous women at no, all no, weren't no. allowed. That's right. To, yeah, yeah. Mm. Or to even, um, you know, if Indigenous women in Canada, um, say in a Navajo community with a friend of mine who was down there, if uh, the woman married outside of the community, she was not yeah, allowed yeah, yeah, back into the yeah, community. Yeah, yeah, to identify, Whereas yeah. the man was. Mm. How fair is that? It's not fair. Mm -hmm, you know, it's mm -hmm. not right. So there's many of these things here, yeah, depending upon who your father was, your mother was. Um, and here you'll see uh, the one that says half blood, then it became half caste. You know, there were many of those derogatory terms. Or even used. like, you know, it says, what's the breed? Oh, exactly. You know, like, exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so after I saw these documents, and that's preponderance of Aboriginal blood out there, and I have to say that all those documents were gifted by the uh, descendants of those, their ancestors to Department of Personal History so everybody could know what you know, families went through, then I thought, well, I've got to chase up my own family. <laughs> so then I, then I did another artist book under the Act, which was directly on our family, got, you know, um, my grandmother Grace's permission to go through, and we found some very interesting things. In fact, she had a good laugh about some of their, you know, documents th that were buried in there, which were very hurtful, but when you hear about them all the time and you don't actually know what's there, it's like this hornet's nest and to actually see what's there, somehow it can actually give you a bit of agency. Mm. And in fact, she was laughing at some of the letters that went back and forth that I'm sure a particular person would never have known would be able to be looked yeah. at years in the future, which mm -hmm. were just saying the most hurtful things, derogatory things, but once again, they're exposed. So what's this one? Is this an exemption to work? Uh, so this one is the Act, um, so an exemption certificate was if you uh, wanted to leave mm. where you were um, living, if you want to apply for marriage, if, you know, there were many, many things mm. that you need an exemption uh, for. But I was just speaking with Marguerite before and she was saying it was different in different places. Mm. Sometimes you were not permitted to uh, speak your language. The main thing was you were not permitted to mix with other Aboriginal people. Mm. Imagine that. You know, imagine that suddenly, yes, you can supposedly be given this exemption to have a bit of freedom, 
but then you can't mix mm. with your own family. Mm. You can't, you know, associate. Mm. And it's just, it's a trickery subterfuge and it's insidious, racist mm. and profoundly hurtful. And I guess this is just one, one of many tools of sort of control and I guess surveillance that they had on mob as well. Um, you know, and do you, do you know much about, you know, how different, I guess, Commonwealth countries would share sort of um, uh, how to control, you know, like their people? Like, you know, there's always been a yarn of how similar apartheid in South Africa is to apartheid here um, in Queensland in particular. And you know, there's a yarn where you know, officials from South Africa came here to look specifically at the Queensland Act and to take back and use as well. I've always heard that mm. and I don't dispute its truth mm. at all, mm. but it would be interesting to for somebody to follow that up and do it as a project and a side by side. And I think there's there are many activists who were in South Africa who were, you know, non blacks mm. who were actually um, fighting against the system as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Different colour people, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mm. 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 Um, yeah, there's, yeah, uh, different, yeah, different forms of, of, of these as well. Like, in, where my old man come from in Moree, the mission manager didn't leave till the 70s. Um, and I'm sure, you know, people are well aware of Queensland having still the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Protection Act in up until, was, it might have been 83? After the Commonwealth Games, uh, they organised mob in Musgrave Park, uh, organised a huge protest because uh, Queensland was the last state uh, in Australia to still have that existing, which saw uh, the Premier hold all rights over mob missions uh, and reserves, but then also have this hardline regime over Aboriginal people here in, in Brisbane, uh, union workers, queer people, you know, there was this real, you know, conservative control uh, that he had and, you know, all it did was just bolster the relationship between, you know, different sections of the community, marginalised sections and, you know, what we saw was huge protest all through Brisbane yeah. and then, you know, that forcing the sort of repeal of that as well and, and forcing him out as well, you know, uh, Bjorki Peterson. Um, for, for that to still sort of last that long and for you to be born under that as well. You know, anybody, you know, any young, younger person that was born in 82, 80 83 you know, were born under the act as well. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that, you know, it, it, it's, it's still in, um, in the living memory of, you know, not just older people, but younger people. Well, there is a, a book that's um, been put out, um, A Preponderance of Aboriginal Blood, a book, and it's got the act actually printed out in it and it's also got a listing of um, when the townships and towns and things like that came up next to when the reserves were put in. And you know, that documentation was put together by many people too, but it's really interesting seeing that analysis and the way that it's sort of um, one meets the other and it's often about land grabs. I remember actually Uncle Richard mm. telling the yarn, I had him on radio and before I left the radio and he was talking about I think after uh, the, the referendum, uh, they were destroying missions yeah. and moving mob into homes. Yeah. So they were literally, like people would wake up to trucks at the front of their houses, yeah. you know, and people sort of reading, you know, an act saying you just have to get out and, you know, you have to move into town now and, you know, take whatever you want now because we're going to destroy everything, so. Well, he's, he's talked about that. He gets so emotional. Mm. And that's a profound moment when he was 15, I think. Yeah. And he was standing there and the bulldozer mm -hmm. comes in and just takes mm -hmm. down their, you know, well, their corrugated there's, and It's the same story as um, uh, the Case Ridge poem by Ani Ujru about yes. a Case Ridge. Exactly. You know, when um, they came in, mm -hmm. one of the last sort of missions mm -hmm. or settlements and then you know, destroyed that as well, yeah. Mm. Cliff Wadigo used to say, I'm not a mission black, I'm a housing commission black. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but in a way... Mm. You think about it and you think, yeah, I mean, and Mum remembers, she was just saying that when you first moved there with Dad, um, there was nothing. There was... Not a blade of grass. Mm. It was just... But bare. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have no idea of history. No. Mm. Learned the history. No, I mm. didn't until I read her poem. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so sick inside. Yeah. 
Is there, I don't know, is there, is there space what for questions? What about the skullduggery? We can yeah. talk about skullduggery because, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, it could go on Katina. and then we'll go to a question. Yeah. Katina. I was wondering, in, in the research of the documents that you've been looking at here, mm -hmm. what, what's the kind of latest date period that you've come across? Uh, somebody else could answer that. I'm not sure about the latest date. I'm only asking because I know that when, um, when Dad got the records of my grandparents, they went until the late 70s, early 80s. So it was that entire span. Are you talking about for this um, this video yeah, here or both, the... Like both. For your research for the show, but then any other kind of um, family record? Mm. Well, the family records, well, with us in particular, I think it's gone back to um, my great-great-grandmother, Rosie, the one who um, escaped the massacre at Lawn Hill. But that's, yeah, and then coming through, I can't remember the latest date when suddenly the records, probably after my grandparents were married, and that was a whole thing of having to get permission to marry from the local protector who was a local policeman, all of that sort of thing. So, but they kept an eye on her. Oh, yeah, they did. And they kept an eye on her that she didn't mix with her own family. Or yeah, I think it would have been 50s, 60s for my grandmother. Yeah. Mm. But Mine's the same. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think that, um, well, my um, great grandfather, once my nan was born on Perga mission, um, they applied for a certificate of exemption um, and, like, after a couple of goes, they got um, the exemption and moved. I think there's police records of surveillance um, when they lived in Idesvale. So they were being watched quite um, closely. Mm. And yeah, my nan was about 90 when she passed. So yeah. Mm. And, and with the Skullduggery records, that was in the 1930s when bones were being traded back and forth between, um, you know, Matron Agnes Kerr from the Birktown Mission, and, or Birktown Hospital, sorry, and the Welcome Museum in, and that only stopped during the Second World War. Otherwise, the boat trading would have gone on, you know. Or, as somebody called her, she must have been a bone enthusiast. <laughs> so that's the whole, you know, she said, there's nothing I would like more than not to be doing my hospital duties and just bone hunting. Meanwhile, all the letters are saying, we know that they don't want us to take their bones, and yet out they go, dig, 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 and uh, gather. I, I remember I interviewed, um, when I was on the radio, uh, it was the, this old white fellow, he was sort of the person who coined, like, um, stolen generation, him and his, him and his old wife. Um, and he mentioned that, like, it was around, like, 70, the early 70s, the mid-70s, when they you know, stop sort of um, going in and, you know, to missions and just grabbing a whole heap of kids. And then it sort of turned to individual families, you know. Um, and if you look at it that way, you know, depending on, you know, if a young person is in care now, you know, uh, it's lo most likely that their parent was in care and, and their record is still being recorded you know, um, so if, if a kid's parent, I think, is in care, then they're most likely, um, uh, they're, they're watched yeah. as well. So, you know, if you have, you know, what, three, two generations back to, or three to the 60s, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking at, um, you, know, you, you know, control and surveillance from their grandparents to their parents to even now as well. And we know, uh, at the moment, there's more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care than there ever was, uh, you know, if you want to say during the Stolen Generation, because it, it, it still continued to happen. You know, then we see, you know, like the over-policing of communities, you know, and you know, all we have to do is ask, you know, ask, you know, your last name, my last name, your last name, and it's associated with sort of a community. That's how we know, you know, um, if we're related to another black fella. Unfortunately, my last name, uh, you'd think I was, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so my last name is Watson through my dad's side of the, non-Aboriginal side of the family, but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gets a bit confusing. Are you a Brisbane Watson? No, uh, no. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I remember the well, first time we met you said that. 
but you know like in terms of surveillance you know like they i believe they still haven't you know whether or not you're an activist or you know you, you know you're 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 whatever you know i you know depending on what state institution your family you know is tied up in you know you, you're still being surveilled and and being watched as well um, like I said, you know, depending on these communities and how over policed they are, like when we had the protest in um, for G20 here in Brisbane in 2014, um, there were police from Western Australia and they were asking for people who were there by first name basis, you know, um, same as down the Gold Coast uh, when we had the protest against the the Commonwealth Games. Oh yeah, colonisation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were there were the, uh, one day uh, they they brought about uh, like 150 coppers, military people too, um, and they had child safety workers. They were asking for kids. They had um, yes, yeah, so they had like docks workers. They had obviously your planes coppers. They had like a, a health and safety sort of food person there and whatnot, and all these other different people. But it was funny that. You know, when they came, they brought these different people who were who are attached to these different institutions that continue to sort of, you know, take from us as well. Well, my grandmother remembers being hidden on um, Riversley Station, where she was born, um, and they'd be warned by the manager's wife, you know, police were coming and to hide. And we always wondered if she hidden, you know, the mothers hid them in caves or whatever. And then years later, she ended up being on a station and separated from her mother at a very young age um, and starting work at the age of five or six. And, but she said she always was threatened with being sent to an island and she didn't know what island it was and she didn't want to go anywhere and not see anybody anymore. So in that case, it could have been um, Mornington Island, which some of the families were, mm. uh, the young kids were sent there, or Palm Island, mm. where, where her sister ended up going. Yeah. I guess, I guess, yeah, I just want to thank, you know, Aunty Julie and, uh, and Amanda for creating the space and, you know, uh, this, uh, this artwork as well, aren't, you know, continue to sort of question um, and make that uncomfortable feeling sort of arise, uh, whether it's in our own people or, you know, in anybody else who calls this place home, uh, because it definitely invokes uh, the question uh, of who really owns this place and what justice has, have we gotten you know, uh, since they've been here. Um, yeah, so definitely big thanks and, you know, um, I'm sure people here you know, follow the work that you do do and, and the Black Lash do do as well. So definitely big thanks to, to everybody here and in the archives as well. I want to, I want to thank Amanda and everybody else and you Bo, but everyone who, who worked on the show here, really want to say thank you so much. Yeah, it's been fantastic, thank you.